Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Tim Besley, uh, and I'm here this lunchtime with Angus Deaton. As a compliment to your lunch, we're going to be talking about Angus's letters from America. Um, for those of you who haven't found the 50th letter yet, it's available in the April RES newsletter. Uh, and sadly for us, it's also Angus's last letter from America. Um, but we're going to reflect on a number of themes in the in the letters, um, and uh, uh, and Angus is going to tell us a little bit about how he's thought about this uh, letter writing over the over the years he's been doing it. Um, but first, of course, Ang Angus needs little introduction. Although one thing he says in his fiftieth letter is that some people only know him through his uh, letters from America. I find that very hard to believe. There are lots of reasons uh, why 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 that's the case. Not least because. Uh, he's certainly one of the most celebrated economists of his generation um, and has uh, the honors uh, that, that go with that, not least uh, winning the 2015 Nobel Prize for his work on consumption, poverty and welfare. Um, he spent time um, befitting the fact he writes letters from America on both sides of the Atlantic, having been uh, born in the UK, uh, teaching at Bristol and Cambridge, and then um, for the remainder of his career at Princeton. So that was always giving him a very interesting vantage point from which to, to write uh, the many letters that he, that he wrote. And, and we're just gonna have a conversation now about the 50th letter, but actually about the, the letters in, in general. Uh, and I'll begin by asking Angus, um, uh, uh, so you got your, your 50th letter. Um, can you tell, tell us a little bit more about why you decided to, to, to do this? And also, when, when you started, did you have any idea at all that you were going to get to uh, 50 letters? Not at all. Thank you very much, Tim, for that introduction. Um, I thought you were going to ask me why have I stopped and that I was going to have to talk about increasing years and disability and so on. But thank you for not doing that. Um, I think when I started, it, it was sort of, there were no letters in the Royal Economic Society newsletter at that point not letter from America, letter from anywhere. And um, the editor at that, that time, um, Thelma Leesner, was a great fan of um, Alistair Cook's letter from America. And she had the idea that it would be fun to do this. And I took a little bit of persuasion, um, but um, it seemed like it might be possible. And I was very fortunate that I did. And I had no idea how long it would go on. It was clearly a trial at the beginning. And I remember working very, very hard on, on the first letter, which was about the minimum wage, um, which actually is sort of a, a or news, an or letter <laughs> that, that has shaped a lot of other ones um, subsequently. And I began to realize over time that I was getting a lot of positive feedback from people about it. Um, and sort of people who didn't know me any other way would say, oh, you're the guy that writes the newsletter. And I tell one story in the letter about how I had a piece that was picked up by the New York Times and I was at my son's wedding and someone at the other family had said, I have no idea who you are. And I said, oh, you know, my hip was in the New York Times. And they said, oh, you're the hip man. So <laughs> that, that. Um, did indicate that it was getting a fairly broad leadership. So it's been a lot of fun to do. I mean, occasionally, as you know, it's like, oh my goodness, I have to do this by Wednesday. But mostly it was just, there was a whole series of topics that seemed interesting to talk about that were different here and that might not be obvious to economists in Britain reading the newsletter, you know, who didn't understand <laughs> the strange peculiarities of this place across the Atlantic. Forgive me if I'm wrong, though. I, I often got the impression, although you were writing the letter from America to the Royal Economic Society members, you had half an eye on what your colleagues in the US might think of what you were writing, because they were commentaries as much on the US profession. Did you ever get feedback from people in the US about the way you were characterizing developments in the American profession? Um, along, along the way, or, or, or did you feel that mostly your audience was on this side of the Atlantic? No, it, it became clear. I, I, it would be interesting. I don't know what the circulation numbers are of the Royal Economic Society newsletter. And in the old days, of course, it wasn't on the web. It was sent around and it sort of 
dropped on your desk. So there certainly were people in America who were aware of it. And in recent years, I've had a fair amount of feedback, sometimes angry about the way I characterized the University of Chicago or, or some school of thought. Um, but I do think what you say is true, but it's also true that I was primarily writing for what I thought was um, you know, an English-British professional economist angle. But of course, it, it, when you say it, it, it's clear that, that by the principle of these letters, which was the American economics, American society and American economic profession as um, through the lens of someone who'd grown up in Britain, was of course interesting to American economists too, because they would say, look at the way this guy sees us. So you're exactly right. And I think over time, um, more and more people here began to began to read it and comment on it. So one thing that's stri striking in, in, in your work, and I mentioned this was actually in the no Nobel citation, is you've worked on topics like poverty and inequality and welfare that perhaps have had less respect, although, again, correct me if I'm wrong, on, on, the, on the other side of Atlantic than being really core topics that have always preoccupied uh, economists in Europe and in the UK in particular. Um, do you think that that, that um, you, you've made any headway, not through the letters, but more generally in, in, in getting the American economics profession to take those topics more seriously? Have the letters just been a reflection of that or have they could they have even contributed to that, at least allowing you to articulate to a kind of wider audience of economists, why you think certain topics ought to be focused on uh, versus others? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I certainly wouldn't claim any causality for what I did on this, but I, I'm sure you're right, there's been a real change. And certainly one of the shocks coming here, like jumping into iced water, um, was that a lot of topics which I thought were central to the way we all worked in Britain, were not much cared about by the American economic profession, nor were they cared about so much by um, economists, uh, by the, the state, by you know the, the public intellectuals, the discussion, and so on in the U.S. And poverty and inequality, um, poverty had always had a focus here. Inequality was really not thought about at all, you know. So Tony Atkinson was more or less my contemporary, as I say in one of the letters that. First seminar I ever heard in economics was, was Tony Atkinson talking about his famous inequality paper. And I thought, my goodness, this is wonderful stuff. You know, I was just a kid. And I think it was the first seminar I ever went to. And as he said, it sort of spoiled me for all subsequent seminars. I thought, you know, they all should be like this. And that would have been great. But when I came here, I'd, I'd been doing a little bit of work on optimal taxes, for instance. And when I was you know, wandering around the United States giving talks, I would offer that and people would say, what? You know, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. And I think it was Hugh Sunshine who said that is a totally uninteresting social equilibrium, you know, and maybe that's right. But certainly by American standards, you know, in Britain where you have sort of a cabinet and the prime minister and they decide what to do and it sort of gets done, you can see that optimal tax would be sort of appealing to a world like that. Whereas in America, where you have this much more chaotic, some would say more democratic um, set of procedures for policymaking, um, the idea of an optimal tax seems sort of absurd. Um, um, I also had this colleague that used to say that government was theft, which is not the way I thought about it in Britain. Now, maybe since I left, you think of government as being theft too. But that wasn't sort of common attitude. Also in Britain, I remember the newspapers were very fond of talking about fat cats, um, for instance, and parading people who were being overpaid. And when I came to America, there was very little of that, of anything that was admiration for fat cats, that everybody wanted to be a fat cat. And it just, you know, that seemed like very different too. So that whole nexus of issues around poverty and inequality, um, also, which is, you know, if, if there was, when I first came, this really admirable economic syllabus in graduate school, which had macro, micro, and econometrics. And there wasn't much room for things like poverty or inequality, which might get mentioned in field courses. And I think that's really changed, um, not because of me, but just because American society has changed. Though I'm not sure that optimal tax is any more 
um, of a flavor here now than it was 30 years ago. Well, I, one, one, one joke I remember from when I first set foot in the US is, yeah, sure, we believe in optimal taxes. Taxes should be zero, especially on the rich. So, uh, uh, but I, yeah, anyway. Uh, um, I mean, I, I guess related to that is also, you were a pioneer in, in particularly doing, looking at household behavior and development. And I suppose a similar thing would be said to be true. At the time you moved to the US, development was not a mainstream topic at all. Um, and uh, um, I guess I guess that, that has really changed. You wouldn't say it was like optimal taxation because development is now one of the, the most vibrant fields in, in, in the US. Well, there, there are two different things there, I think. One was that it's very hard to imagine, um, but you know, when I, when I came here in first in 79 and then again permanently in 83, um, there were very few micro data sets available of any sort. Um, so that was beginning to happen. Um, I remember I had a, some data from the family expenditure surveys that I was in Britain, which I worked on in the late 70s. Um, but there was very, very little work being done on micro data because these data were not accessible. And in fact, it was extremely difficult um, to get a hold of these data and statistical offices didn't think it was their job to release microdata, et cetera, et cetera. So that was a revolution that I was writing, um, certainly not one that, um, you know, I had anything to do um, with happening. I mean, in fact, that's obviously one of the big technical changes that's deeply affected our profession um, over the last quarter of the century. Um, so development was part of that. Um, so you know, just as labor economists um, were getting into using the current population survey and all the surveys that we all used to, <coughs> um, the people who were interested in development. Um, and I remember the first I did on that was I, in the World Bank where I was working the summer of 1980. Um, I managed to get a hold of the magnetic tape um, from a Sri Lankan um, household survey. So I started playing those games too. And that again became, um, you know, a big industry, and then it evolved into a lot of people started doing that, and then it evolved into randomized control trials and all the rest of the stuff that's been done in development. But there really wasn't much done. And I remember in the World Bank in 1980, um, even getting your hands on the micro data, the statistical office routinely overwrote magnetic tapes with the New Year's data. Um, because magnetic tapes were scarce and data really wasn't scarce. Um, and so you really couldn't get any back series out of the sort. So all of that has changed. I, I tried to, that's certainly shaped the letters uh, as it shaped the profession over time. And when, when you moved to the, to, to the US, was there a, a sort of feeling that empirical work in general was taken more seriously on, well, at Princeton in particular, but perhaps in the US more generally than it was taken in the UK at the time? Was that, I know, I know you've done all your prior work when you were in the Department of Applied Ec Economics in Cambridge and, and then at Bristol, but, but what was, was the US far ahead? And, and is it still far ahead in, in terms of empirical work, do you feel? I, I don't know. I've never really thought about that. I, I didn't see any discontinuity there. Um, and as you said, I grew up in Cambridge. My mentor was Richard Stone, you know, who's done empirical work um, his whole life. And I don't think I ever felt either in Britain or the US um, discriminated against um, because I was doing empirical work. And as you said, I've been a long tradition at Princeton, um, especially in labor economics, uh, of doing empirical work. And I think that was pretty general. So I, one of the things I've repeatedly written about in the letter, which I think is, is really important is how open the American profession is so that young people can do very well, very quickly. Um, and, you know, it's still possible um, to be a full tenure professor at Harvard when you're 26 years old. Um, it's rare as it should be, but um, people who come along with new ideas um, and new skills certainly get recognized very quickly. And when I was very young in Britain, that wasn't true. But then what happened in Britain was all the new universities were built um, in the 60s and so on. Uh, 
and you went from a situation in which you had to wait for people to die to be promoted to a situation in which, um, you know, one of my colleagues had said, we just go down to the street and see if we could find someone who knew anything about economics and make them a professor. Um, so the, there was a big opening um, for a while, and then it closed down again around the, you know, with Mr. Thatcher um, around the time that I came to the U.S., which was actually one of the main reasons for doing so. Yeah, well, just picking up on something you, you just said, that your, your 2007 letter, which sticks in, in my mind, I think you referred to in your 50th letter, around the richness and variety of the job market topics. Um, and of course, that, that's, that's not quite the same as, as openness, meaning that I suppose some of those people, the ones you saw at Princeton, at least with the kind of cream of the, the crop, but more generally, I, I, I suppose that there is... There are returns to to risk taking that younger economists can can exploit. Do you think that's still true, or do you think people are, are tending now to be much more conservative because of the either the journal process or just the general structure of careers and how to get on? You, you still think there are a lot of people doing innovative and risk taking work when they're coming out of their PhDs? Yeah, I think the opportunities are there. Of course, COVID has um, really shrunk things this year. And it seems there are not so very many jobs um, this year, which is what you would expect. A lot of colleges are, are in trouble and the future is very uncertain. But to come back to the more original question, I mean, I think that, you know, <laughs> here's two old guys talking about when they were young. No, but when I was young <laughs> and you were even younger, um, the, the profession was very clearly defined. You know, and I said already about the micro, macro, and econometrics. And there was a feeling that those were three aspects of the same animal, which in the background would be general equilibrium theory or something. Um, the theory people were taking more micro approach to the macro, more macro, the econometrics um, was trying to teach you how to use, in, in those days, in the early 80s, um, the, the micro data revolution was really becoming a big deal. So there was a huge explosion. Um, in methods and how econometric, how econometricians should handle those data. Um, I was, it was sort of an amazing time. I remember when I first started thinking about econometrics and you'd go to a European conference or something, the topics were like um, multi-stage least squares estimation or K class estimators and so on. And it sort of got stuck in a rut. And then there was this time in the early eighties um, when the techniques and the micro stuff and the actual applied people were all running along together, racing each other to sort of do new stuff. And that was really um, um, very exciting. Um, I think subsequently that's, um, you know, it used to be you went to the econometric seminar at Princeton, I think elsewhere too, it'd be absolutely jam packed um, because all the researchers from whatever area were at the econometric seminar, and the last time I went to one at Princeton, it was much, much more sparsely um, attended. But, you know, there was a sense in the early 80s that the path ahead was pretty clear. Um, you knew what sort of things to work on to get ahead. There were clearly leaders, like the people I knew, like Richard Stone and Jim Merleys and Tony Atkinson, um, were all people, there's Dennis Sargon, um, there were all people who were working on sort of the same thing, and there was a clearly well-defined path. I don't think that's there anymore. So I think it's much, much harder um, to be a young economist now uh, than it was then. I mean, the geniuses will always do incredibly well because they'll think of new ways to do things, and people will say, wow, and they'll get jobs and they'll make their way. Um, but for those of us who weren't geniuses, you know, having a track to work on and in which you could train and develop your muscles, develop how to do this stuff was a really, I'm always very, very glad I had it. I mean, there was a runway, a place to work on, um, which you could develop skills, which you could then use in a bunch of useful things. And I think that's much harder now. Though, you know, we ought to be careful, Tim. Here's two old guys talking about what it was like when we were young. <laughs> Not everyone <laughs> would appreciate that. 
So can I, can, can we just picking up on, on a theme that comes up regularly in your letters, and that's health. And you spent a good deal of your um, career, you, the, the last 25 years, should I say, probably a little longer, working on health issues. I see your book with, with Anne Case behind you, Deaths of Despair, which is your, your latest piece. Um, to what extent was your interest in health provoked by suddenly being in in a in the US health system because I, the stuff I remember earliest reading of yours about health was on health and inequality um, so may, maybe that the US is a natural place to be drawn to that debate uh, although you know the, the world over those debates take place it's not a uniquely American yeah. thing but but um, uh, so, so, so how, how did you get get into health? And and I guess the bigger question is: are, are you are you pessimistic about the potential for reform of the American healthcare system? Um, because you, in, particularly in the recent book with Anne, you're 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 pretty critical of the role that that's played in in deaths of despair and the whole series of events around that. Well, it's, it's, yes, I remember it, it's always been a productive area for me, especially for the letters from America, because it was an obvious area in which America was really a foreign country. You know, it's like if you go to the tropics, the trees are full of parrots. Well, you come to America and the trees are full of strange doctors making lots of money and doing things very differently. And, you know, I had young kids at that point, and I remember. Um, almost taking one of my kids along to a foot doctor, having confused the diatrist with pediatrician. You know, they sort of say the same thing. Uh, but, you know, one of the immediate differences is in Britain, if you get sick or you get something wrong with you, you go along to your doctor. You know, you, then your doctor would filter you to see the podiatrist or the pediatrician. So you didn't even have to know what these people were called. So it was suddenly just a, a very, very different um, world. And I sort of liked the British world, um, I must say, though, again, I've been away for 30 years, and I know that um, there are always problems with healthcare, and providing healthcare is just one of these incredibly difficult things. Um, you know, it, it's a really difficult problem to solve to get it to work in any sort of reasonable way at all. But, you know, the British and American systems are the two ends of the extremes um, among rich countries. And so there was much to explore there. And, you know, one of my best known newsletters was the one where, you know, I had to get a new hip. And I had been in hospital since I was, I think, 14 years old. So it was a new experience for me um, in lots of different ways and much to comment on. And it was also at a time when the Bush administration was trying to teach us all to be better healthcare consumers and that we would go and check prices and so on. I don't think I ever checked the price, though I did a little bit of that. Um, but the hardest thing was just finding a doctor. And of course, everybody tells you you've got to find a doctor and everybody claims that they find the best one and all the rest of it. But this search is completely hopeless because they have very good incentives not to tell you who's any good. You know, whereas with any economics, you can find out pretty quickly who are the people who know about international monetary arrangements or something. But actually finding a good search is even confident. Um, was very, very difficult. My favorite line there was the person who said to me, you should try him, he's great. He's the guy who did the Pope, right? And I thought, well, you know, the, the Pope has lines of communication that I don't have. <laughs> you might be able to, you know, be revealed to him just exactly who, but he said, you know, he's past it now, he's old and he's handshake and all the rest of it. So it, that was uh, quite entertaining in its way. Um, but also, as you say, um, this looms very large in America. I mean, we're spending nearly 20% of GDP um, on healthcare. Um, I think the next highest is Switzerland, which spends about 10% of GDP. And we have a larger GDP. So, you know, the, the, the total amount of money uh, being spent on this is astronomical. We also have sort of the worst life expectancy among any rich country in the world, and what's more is it's been falling even before COVID uh, came along. So uh, my friend Sam Preston is just having a paper coming out, I think, this week in, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, showing that up till 2019, you know, before COVID came, 
if the mortality rates by age could have been the same as the average of Britain, Germany, France, and Italy, I think, um, that would have saved half a million lives, um, you know, comparable to the number of lives that were lost, actually more than the number of lives that were lost in 2020 um, through COVID. So the system is just doing incredibly badly. And, you know, people say to me, what would you do instead? Well, I'd say, well, there's a lot of other systems around the world. Um, you can pick and choose any of the, one of them you want. They're all different. Different countries handle this in different ways. But what you don't want is the one we have now. And part of the issue in the book was we were claiming this healthcare responsibility, this healthcare system is actually killing people um, rather than curing them. Um, and the cost of the healthcare, because it stops all the other things that we need to spend money on um, in the US, is helping destroy <coughs> the low wage labor market um, for less educated Americans. And that's sort of a tragedy. But you say, well, are we hopeful for reform? It'll get reformed eventually, because I, I'm not sure who is the person who said, you know, the trend is um, intolerable. The truth is it won't be tolerated. You know, I mean, eventually these things get sorted out. But it's so well protected by the enormous sums of money it generates and the lobbying and pressure on politics that comes with that. And it's so hidden so that people don't know what harm it's doing them. And even, you know, these mechanisms of destroying the labor market and helping destroy working class culture are not obvious to anyone, even to a lot of economists. And so the, the pressure um, for change is very hard to focus. Um, and I'm afraid that COVID, by having sort of sanctified the pharma companies, um, you know, who went from um, killing people through addiction and, you know, um, pumping out opioids um, for enormous profit um, to being, you know, real criminal villains to being seen as the heroes and all their defenders are now screaming in the newspapers saying, you know, people ought to apologize to pharma um, for ever having guided them and they're our saviors and the American system is what we need. So I don't see any prospect for immediate reform, um, even with an administration that understands these issues very well. Um, Janet Yellen is all over this, understands it perfectly, so does Cecilia Rouse. So it's Helen Boucher, uh, Jared Bernstein, all the people in the council. And so we'll see. And I'm sure we'll try to do something, but it's extraordinarily difficult. And of course, you, you had your um, moment in, in, in the sun. Perhaps you'd like to tell everyone who hasn't read your, uh, your relevant letter about your experience of meeting Barack Obama in the White House. And I don't know to what extent in, 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 in the conversation that ensued, you got into the into debates about what needed to be done in terms of health care reform. But perhaps you can just tell tell the story because it's a, it's a nice one. And then, and then uh, I say, this yeah, is a story. Fine. I don't think we were sort of into the health reform as part of the deaths of despair, but Anna and I had just published the first paper on Dust of Despair was something that Anne thought up later in a um, press interview. And that term became sort of part of the general uh, vocabulary. But we just published that paper um, and I won the Nobel Prize two weeks before that. <clears throat> and you know, you get a lot of publicity when the Nobel Prize <laughs> comes. Um, in fact, I remember there was a reporter outside my door about 10 minutes after I got the telephone call. Um, and you get besieged by the press. But then this paper came out two weeks later and the besieging around that paper was much larger than the besieging around. I mean, I don't think I've ever, certainly never before, and, and I will really again, um, publish a paper that has that sort of um, effect. Um, but in those days, and maybe it will happen again, the American noblesse were invited to the White House to go to the Oval Office um, and meet the president. Um, that was a tradition that was discontinued <laughs> under Donald Trump. I think the first laureate not to be invited in economics was um, Richard Taylor, who, as some 
one, I think, in the New York Times that pointed out, you know, what has Trump to learn from some, someone who works on self-control? <laughs> so, but Anne and I were invited to the White House along with the um, four other American artists of that year. And it was really one of the high, I mean, the whole Swedish experience is quite something, but the, um, this experience in the White House was every bit as good. And we sort of waited outside in this little anteroom with Norman Rockwell drawings of American life. And several of them about people waiting outside the White House in order to lobby the president. And you realize, of course, all originals, you know, all the rest of it, you're sitting there and then eventually um, a message comes that Dan and I are, we've been put in alphabetical order and I was not the leading letter. Um, and so the message came from inside the Oval Office saying that um, Professor Deaton and Professor Case um, come first. Um, and so the door was opened by Obama himself and he shook my hand. And I looked over my shoulder and said, I'd like to introduce you to, and he interrupted and said, um, Professor Case needs no introduction to me. And, you know, as soon as I talk to everybody else here, we're going to talk about that paper that you've just written. And he'd read it down to the footnotes, and we spent this sort of 45 minutes in the White House. You know, and he, he certainly talked to all the other guys too, but it was clear he was not quite as interested in DNA repair as he was in deaths of despair. Um, among the white working class. And he actually made a terrific suggestion, which we took up in the book, which is that he said, what you're writing about is almost exactly parallel to what had happened in the black community 30 or 40 years before. Um, and we wanted to explore that parallel, um, which is what we did. So there's actually an acknowledgement in the book um, to helpful comments from um, President Barack Obama. Um, but that was certainly one of the high points of many high points of that, that time. And of course, we came out of the White House in there and said, I'm in love. <laughs> it shouldn't be me. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so an another theme that, that runs through many of the letters, and you remark on this in the 50th letter too, is the theme of inequality. And uh, for those who don't know, you're now chairing a, a, a review um, with, based at the IFS funded by the Nuffield Foundation um, so, so my question there is, and, and this is a little bit based on conversations you and I have, have had um, recently, is how, how far do you think the kind of ec economic approach um, to inequality sort of lacks some core um, or, or, or misses certain core elements that we, we perhaps therefore are not paying sufficient attention to? And I particularly want to join that to some of the themes again in Deaths of Despair, because I think it comes out in some of what you say there as well. Yes, I, I think that's right. I, I don't want to minimize, I have to be very careful here, because people keep asking me, you know, what is the IFS review going to come up with? What are your findings? And I say, well, we're a long way from findings, and nothing is say here should be interpreted as the views um, of the review, because they're really not. But as you say, um, we've learned a lot um, going along this path. And of course, economists, when they are, talk about inequality, they immediately start thinking about Gini coefficients, and they think about income and consumption as well. And that's clearly really important. Um, it's, I think, been especially important here during the crisis, during the COVID crisis, because unlike the UK, the stock market here is at all time record levels. It's way higher than it was before the crisis, um, which means not only that Jeff Bezos has doubled his fortune, that there are many, many more billionaires than there were before, but sort of quotes ordinary people like you and me, <laughs> whose pensions are invested in the stock market, um, have become made a huge amount of money um, during this epidemic at a time when other people are suffering. So that there's been a huge widening of some things, though obviously the um, responses by the government um, have done a lot um, because they, you know, the American Rescue Act, for instance, is, is quite well targeted towards um, the lower parts of the income distribution. So all of that is important, but just now to get the answer to the question, um, I think there's importance 
that what people are worried about when they worry about inequality is more to do with um, some groups not being treated as well as other groups. And I think the actual demarcations of the division are different in different countries. So in Britain, it may be more to do with region and occupation, whereas here I think is much more to do with an educational divide. And, you know, one of the terms that Adam Smith used over and over and over again was esteem and just how important esteem and respectability is to people. And you get this feeling now that there's this division between this educated elite who has a four-year college degree or more, <clears throat> which is about a third of the population, and the less educated people who don't have a BA. And they're really suffering. You know, their wages have fallen. Um, the wages of men without a BA has had a trend decline for nearly 70 years, well, 50 years now, um, and showing no change in that. I mean, it goes up during good times, but the long-term trend is down, and a slowly progressive detachment from the labor force with other people without a BA too, um, which used to be just men, but it's now happening to women without a BA too. And then the stuff that Anne and I write about, which is, you know, the pain, the morbidity, and the deaths, um, and the disintegration of social life, so the disintegration of marriage, which is not happening to people with a BA, but it is happening to people without a BA, um, fertility, you know, and any of these social things that you want to be in good shape or not in good shape at all, and it's always differential. Um, in Britain, I think of, um, you know, these discussions about people who come from somewhere or people who come from anywhere, is that a dis distinction? Um, but and, and the Brexit vote, a bunch of people who had become relationally unequal to the people who were running the country. So there are these huge divisions, which are partly to do with money, but seem much more to do with respect and with esteem. Um, globalization is not helping with this. Um, globalization seems to be making uh, the educated cosmopolitan elite um, doing very well out of it. I mean, you and I can give really good examples of people who've ridden the meritocracy. You know, we both came from pretty humble, you know, um, settings. We're both knights, I have a goodness sake. You know, we're part of this elite. But, and, you know, we didn't think Brexit was a very good idea, right? <laughs> but, you know, a lot of people had a chance to say, can you hear me now? Stop doing this. And, you know, in the U.S., we've got Donald Trump. And I think the, these divisions, which you would see all through Europe, you know, I mean, even in, you know, so-called ideal countries like Sweden has its um, right-wing opposition, a lot of disaffected people. Um, I think that's the division that we probably need to worry about the most. And it's the division that could really pull us all apart. I mean, you've got still seven, more than 70 million people who voted for Donald Trump, but the majority of those think that the election would be rigged. And, you know, it's not entirely clear that you can, that a democracy is going to survive very long um, when you have that sort of incredible division um, in, in which people, a lot of people are not buying into it. And it's very easy to say, well, you know, the Chinese model is a terrible model. We really like to live in China and be watched all the time and be subject to this dictatorship. Um, but when you look at what's happening in America, you know, it's not working so great either. So those are the things that I'm most worried about. Those are the things I've learned most about as we've been sort of taking evidence for this question. I have no idea what we're going to come to um, in the end, but I hope these issues will figure um, large, as well as the traditional economist one. You know, there are going to be lots of genie coffers. What's curious about that? So um, you mentioned the, the seminar that Tony Atkinson gave, and I'm sure it would have been a remarkable experience or work on the optimal tax model, which I, I certainly grew to love at the, and partly from reading your work. Um, but that welfare economic framework does look somewhat imperfect for thinking through the issues. And, and sometimes we lament and, and uh, that welfare economics has disappeared from the curriculum um, at all. Um, but possibly the 
if, if it does come back, it's got to be a different kind of well for economics if it's going to be useful for addressing those issues. I mean, you and I have both been heavily influenced over the years by Amartya Sen, uh, who, who offered always a, a different form of well for economics. But I'm not not entirely sure what we what we need to do if we believe that normative economics is important for informing policy, and yet the model that we were brought up on doesn't quite look like it's 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 getting to the issues we care about. No, I agree with that. And and you know when you look at the axiomatic basis for like Tony Atkinson's work uh, of sort of or Jim Murley says the diminishing margin of utility and utilitarianism underneath that, which I don't think we really believe anymore. Um, nor the anonymity, which sort of ignores that groups are important, um, just don't seem right anymore. And uh, Marcia, to you and to me, um, has been a real guide um, through the years. And in some ways, he's worn very well because he doesn't commit himself to a lot of things. You know, he'll say, and you and I have talked about this, you know, he identify local injustices and do something about them. And that seems like something that works better in this day and age. But then as you come back to the thing we were talking about before, um, <laughs> these young economists who could take this model before and say, you know, I can play with optimal tax theory too, and I can get some nice answers. You know, what are they supposed to do with this much vaguer, uh, much more difficult to grasp um, and where it takes you into areas of philosophy where there's no agreement at all, um, for instance. And, you know, so good economists come along and do marvelous things. And I saw some of your speakers at this meeting are clearly among those people who find new ways into these things. So that's great. And I see young people who I much admire doing really interesting stuff. Um, but it's harder. And it would be nice to have, maybe we don't need it. We just can't expect to have a welfare economics that's as shut and dry as that was. You, you, you mentioned earlier, which I, the, the issue of showing them the runway. And may, maybe that's something that in, in, the, in the review that you're leading, or more generally, there needs to be a, a mapping out of a set of issues that we need to know the answers to, to try and provide that guidance would that be a, a way to, to think about this that you know in, in the absence of that um, how are we going to get the brightest and the best young people working on those type of problems yeah I mean that would be awful I'm not sure we could do that I mean we, we've got our work cut out just to say sort of anything intelligent and useful and I mean some of what you're talking about really is sort of the training of young economists uh, to do that and, you know, there's a model which is exemplified most extreme, perhaps, at Harvard, where the idea is that the economists should be selected for their smarts, and we shouldn't really bother to train them at all. You know, so the sequence, there's no real econometrics in the sequence anymore, and so on. Um, and, you know, we just give them a nice place to work, and we don't ask them to teach. And we just tell them they're certified geniuses on entry and then see what happens. And that works for the geniuses, but the trouble is anything works for the geniuses. And developing, you know, a real, if you like, a curriculum syllabus for young graduate students, I think is very hard. Great, well, time, time is running tight. I'm gonna just finally end with something from one of your, your letters where you referred to a quote by Bob Zellick, who, who said something, I'm probably paraphrasing badly here, in physics, Nobel, prizes awarded for being correct, while in economics, they're awarded for being brilliant. And then you ask us, and or, or even think you hint that sometimes you decide to assign particular Nobel laureates to uh, either the correct or the brilliant category. Um, well, when I think of you, Angus, I, I don't wanna make that choice. I, I think you belong in both. Um, and uh, as your, your, your letters have been a, a real virtuoso uh, performance throughout, something that, that, that we'll all, I think, miss a huge amount. Um, but, but we entirely understand that you, you're, the marginal value of your time is incredibly high and you'll, you'll dis, displace your letter writing activity with something equally valuable, I'm sure. But, but I, I, I just want to, to end by uh, 
uh, underlining just how appreciative the Royal Economic Society has been for your willingness to do this. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure um, uh, for those of you who don't only know you through your letters, um, there may be a few of you who do, um, we, we've, all, uh, we've all absolutely uh, appreciated this and, uh, and also your willingness to come and, and chat to us today as a kind of fitting um, uh, um, end to the, to, to, to the whole process. For those of you who are listening, you can rate this session as an option within, uh, within the, uh, um, the software that we're using. Um, but I, I have no doubt that you, you like me, will, will have uh, enormously enjoyed the opportunity to, to learn from Angus uh, today. So thank you, Angus, and thanks to everyone for tuning in. Thanks very much, Devin. Thanks to the Royal Economic Society for giving me this opportunity to write these letters and for providing such an appreciative audience. It's been a huge pleasure over the years. Thank you all.